Okay, recording has started. So, um, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Math 115. Hope everybody's doing well. We're going to continue today uh, with what we were talking about last time. So, let me share the screen. And uh, let's see, let me let me review a little bit of what I talked about last time. So this week we are we are um, sort of continuing with more trigonometric stuff. OK, so um, we went over what we talked about last week and then we started talking about a few new things. OK, so we started talking about the properties of these trigonometric functions. OK, so those properties involved the signs of these trig functions. OK, so like when are they positive and negative? OK, uh, we also talked about some trigonometric identities. OK, so different ways to write trigonometric uh, expressions. And what we just barely started to talk about last time was even an oddness of trigonometric functions. OK, so today we're going to finish up talking about that and hopefully start on learning about the graphs of trigonometric functions. Um, so let's see here. Oh, yeah, let me recall for everyone the notion of a reference angle. Remember, the reference angle for any angle theta is just the coterminal angle theta prime, such that theta prime is kind of nicely square in between 0 and 360 degrees, or in between 0 and 2 pi radians. OK, and um, the, the nice thing about reference angles is that they work nicely with the so-called periodicity of sine and cosine. OK, so since sine and cosine are periodic functions, uh, they will give the same value for any angle which is coterminal. OK, so if we have angle one is theta and we take theta plus two pi n for any number n, which is an integer, OK, then sine and cosine are going to return the same value when we plug in those other angles as long as they're coterminal to our original angle. So since we know the reference angle is coterminal, then we can really just only ever really care about the values of sine and cosine for values of theta, which lie in between 0 and 360 degrees. That's the whole point of the reference angle, is that rather than memorizing how to do sine for every single angle on the entire continuum, OK, we just memorize how to do sine and cosine for everything which is between 0 and 360, and we forget about the rest of it, and we say, well, it just repeats after that. So that was about periodicity. Uh, then we learned some trigonometric identities. And the most important trigonometric identity was this one up here at the top, this cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to 1. OK, and when we have that, we can just manipulate it in various ways to get the other ones. So if you want to get this one, we should just divide both sides by cosine squared theta and you'll get what you want. And if you want to get the one on the bottom, you should divide by sine squared theta. OK, so the most important one is just this cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one. And it comes from the Pythagorean theorem. OK, I think Morgan was telling us about that last time. OK, it comes from the fact that we're on the unit circle. OK, and cosine of, the of theta is kind of like x squared okay cosine squared theta is like the x value of the point squared and then the sine value is the y value so if we square it we get y squared and we add we get x squared plus y squared we should expect that this is going to be equal to one since we're working with the unit circle uh, or if you just look at the triangle then it's the pythagorean theorem okay so that was about trigonometric identities and finally, we were talking about even and oddness 
so all we really talked about last time was we just recalled what is the definition of an even function and an odd function. Uh, and the definition of an even function is that if we plug, if we take some value x and we consider the value of the function at that point x, we're going to consider now what is happening to the value of the function at the x value negative x. Okay, so we want to check. We start by just considering some x value and we consider what is the height of the function at that point. And now we're going to compare that with the height of the function at some other x value, which is negative x. And we want to see whether the heights are the same or opposite or neither. OK, so a function is not necessarily even or odd. OK, so. Um, if we have this case and we're symmetric about the y axis, then we're even or if the x value is. If the height of this. X. Well, if the height of the function at this x value is exactly the negative of the height of the x value. Uh, the height of the function at the positive x value, then we call it odd. OK, so the words we had for that were that if we're, if it's even, we're going to be symmetric about the y axis. And if it's odd. Then it's going to be symmetric about the origin. OK. So that was even an oddness and then at the very end we kind of talked about these two functions x squared and x cubed and we established that x squared is an even function since it's symmetric about the uh, y axis but really the main way we check whether a function is even or odd is by plugging in we check if we plug in negative x and we plug in x into the function do we get the same thing and for x squared it's true we get the same thing for x cubed, if we plug in negative x and x, well, we wind up getting negative x cubed is equal to negative x cubed. And that was how we express negative f of x. OK, so this is how we got that this one was odd. OK, so we're all up to speed now, so let me pause before we start anything new and ask the class. Are there any questions about any of the review material that I just went over? Um, that's not totally clear or any like administrative questions about the class. OK, seems like not. So then we're going to start on new material now. OK, and and now we're going to consider. Whether the functions sine theta. And cosine theta. Are even or odd. OK, and it turns out that that they're going to be nicely even or odd. OK, we're not going to be in an in a neither situation. OK, so let's check. All right, and the way I'm going to check this. Is by just recalling. What. Sine and cosine are by definition. OK, so sine is defined to be the Y coordinate. OK, sine of theta is defined to be the Y coordinate of the point, which is on the unit circle. 
which corresponds to the angle theta. OK, so if we want to know what is sine of theta, well, we just mark theta here on our unit circle. And then maybe we draw a triangle and we figure out what that point is, which is on the unit circle. And then we just say, if we want to know what sine of theta does, well, it just takes that angle and it spits out this y value of the point, which is on the unit circle corresponding to theta. OK, so now if we want to talk about what is sine of negative theta going to do? Well, all we have to do is draw the angle negative theta, which means instead of measuring in the counterclockwise direction, we're going to measure theta in the clockwise direction. OK, that's what it meant for an angle to be negative. OK, and then we're just going to check, well, What's the difference between these two points we get on the unit circle? Well, they have the same x value. OK, they both lie on this dotted line here. OK, but what's changed between these two is the y coordinate. So when we measure with theta, we got x comma y, and when we measured with negative theta, we got x comma negative y, where this y is the same between both of these. Okay. So when we did sine of theta, it should spit out the y coordinate, so we get y of this top point. And then when we do sine of negative theta, it should spit out the y coordinate of the other point, which in this case is negative y. So we found that if we plug in the negative value of what we originally plugged in, we get the value of the original function, except it's negative now. So what is that telling us about sine in terms of even and oddness? What do we think? Is sine going to be even or odd based on this information? OK, Abdurrahman says odd. Oh man, my chat is messing up, I think. Anyone agree, disagree? Heidi agrees. OK, I agree too. This was the definition of oddness, OK? We have sine of theta equals y and sine of negative theta equals negative y, OK? That was the definition of oddness. You can see it right here, OK? f of x equals negative f of negative x. That's exactly what we just showed. So this function is odd. Now, how about cosine? Well, if I consider cosine of theta, cosine is going to give me the x coordinate. OK, so if I measure my angle theta and I get my cosine theta, it's going to give me the, the x coordinate of that point p of theta. And then if I plug in cosine of, this should be a negative theta, cosine of negative theta, then I draw my negative angle here and I get the point which is on the X, uh, the point which is on the uh, unit circle down in this fourth quadrant. And I can 
notice that this point has the same x coordinate as I originally had. So I, I again, when I do cosine of negative theta, I get x once again. So cosine is characterized by having the property that if I do cosine of theta, I get x, and if I do cosine of negative theta, I get the same exact thing. Which means that cosine is going to be an even function. Okay, cosine is going to be an even function. Okay, so we've kind of established the even and oddness of sine and cosine. And just like all of the other things that we've been doing, we're going to now establish the even and oddness of all of the other trigonometric functions just by using these two facts. Okay, we know that sine is odd and we know that cosine is even. And those two facts are going to tell us everything we need to know about whether the other trigonometric functions are even or odd. OK, so let's try tangent of theta. OK, well, tangent of theta we know is equal to sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. OK, we have sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. So if we want to check, well, what is the relationship between tangent theta and tangent of negative theta. Well, tangent of negative theta is going to be sine of negative theta divided by cosine of negative theta. And now I use the properties that I already know about sine and cosine. OK, I know that sine is an odd function, so I know that if I plug in negative theta, into sine, I'm going to get negative sine of theta by the oddness property. And likewise, since cosine of negative theta is just the same thing as cosine of theta, I can just rewrite the denominator as cosine of theta. And this whole thing, I can factor out the negative sign. So I get negative sine theta over cosine theta. And that's just negative tangent of theta. So what did I find out? I found out that if I plug negative theta into tangent, then I can just rewrite tangent by its definition and then do a little bit of GCF. I mean, I really didn't even do much. Really, the main legwork here was in going from the left to the right side of this equal sign. OK, that was where I used sine is even. I'm sorry, sine is odd. And cosine is even. So I used those two properties to express the sine of negative theta as negative sine of theta. And then I used the property that cosine is even to express cosine of negative theta as being the same as cosine of theta. OK, so this was where the legwork happened. And then I just factored out that negative sign and I rewrote a little bit. And the end result is that if I plug negative theta into tangent, I get the exact opposite thing that I would get if I just do tan. I get negative tan of theta. And this is telling me that tangent is an odd function. This tells me tangent is odd. OK, I'm going to go through these next two pretty quickly because they're pretty easy. Well, secant theta. Well, let me pop quiz the class. If I do secant theta, what what is the relationship between secant theta and our and our usual trigonometric functions? It's one of those ones that's a reciprocal. It's it's going to be equal to one over some trigonometric function of theta. What is that trigonometric function that we should use for secant? Yeah, one over cosine. Okay. 
okay? One over cosine of theta. So we got to remember that this is not the way that it should be, okay? We have secant goes with cosine and cosecant goes with sine. Okay, so we always want to remember that. Okay, and what do we think? Just based on this relationship, do we think that secant of theta is going to be an even or an odd function? Okay, good. Some evens coming through relatively quickly, and you're exactly right. Uh, because you can kind of see how the logic would go. If I plug in secant of theta, um, sorry, negative theta, secant of negative theta, well, that's just going to be equal to 1 over cosine of negative theta. And, well, I know that cosine is an even function, so this is equal to 1 over cosine of theta. Okay. Um, let's see here. Yeah, okay. Sorry, just thinking about something else. Uh, so, and this is just equal to secant theta. OK, so this is how we get the relationship uh, that that secant is going to be an even function. All right, and then cosecant, well, same deal. We just rewrite. It's 1 over sine theta. And we know that uh, cosecant of theta, and I'm sorry, I'm really bad at writing writing the parentheses every time. Sometimes we don't write the parentheses, but I don't want to confuse you guys because I want you guys to remember that these print that these are functions. OK, so we need to think of these as functions. For example, if we want to solve cosine of theta equals one, we can't just say, well, theta equals one over cosine. OK, this is not how we can I don't even want to write this on the board and confuse you guys because this is not how we can how we can do this. These are functions. So if we want to undo them, we have to use the inverse function, okay, which we haven't even really talked about yet, but we'll get there. Okay, so cosecant theta negative theta would be equal to one over sine of negative theta would be equal to 1 over negative sine of theta by the oddness of sine would be equal to negative of 1 over sine of theta. If you want to pull it out like that, you can. And that's equal to negative cosecant of theta. So we get cosecant of negative theta is equal to negative cosecant of theta, and this is telling us that cosecant is odd. OK, and then cotangent of theta, likewise, this is just equal to uh, cosine theta divided by sine theta. And if we do cotangent of negative theta, well, you're going to have the same process, and we'll get negative cotangent of theta. Because we have sine is odd, so that's going to kind of make our denominator negative and everything will become negative then. So cotangent is also odd. OK, so now we have everything. We've got sine is odd, cosine is even, tangent is odd, secant is even, cosecant is odd, and cotangent is odd. But if you want to remember all of these without really having to memorize any of them. Just remember the following. The two that go with S, 
are even. So sine and secant. No, what am I talking about? That's not true. Sorry, cosine and secant are even, and all the rest of them are odd. Okay, cosine and its reciprocal, secant, are the two even trigonometric functions, and the rest of them are odd. So that way it takes up a little bit less brain space. Okay, um, are there any questions about how I did all of these proofs? Uh, this is pretty standard logic, um, and it really just kind of requires you to have a decent understanding of, of the definitions of even and odd. Um, so if you're struggling with that, I think a, a good place for you to review would be the lecture where we talked about even and odd functions uh, and, and go back and take a closer look at that and try to get a better understanding of when a function is even or odd and how to identify when a function is even or odd. Because um, there were some students that struggled with that on the exam. Um, so I'd imagine that you might be a little bit confused right now if you didn't have a great grasp of that before. OK, any questions about all of this stuff that we just talked about with the evens and odds? Okay. If you don't like this really algebraic way of, uh, of writing things down, okay, this really kind of explicit function form is uh, it's very clear, but it's maybe not that intuitive. Uh, so if you want something that's more intuitive, you can always return to the good old unit circle. OK. OK, go away. Thank you. And remember that we have uh, the following. We have A, S, T, C, right? So if you want to consider what's going on with the trigonometric functions, You want to consider what's going on with the trigonometric functions when we take a value theta versus negative theta. So here's here's theta, and here is negative theta. If you want to consider whether the function is even or odd, well, you just take a look at these two points, OK? And you consider, well, say we want to know, you know, whether cosine is even or odd. Well, all I have to do is say, I know from ASTC that cosine is positive here and cosine is positive here. So this is telling me that cosine is an even function, since cosine is going to have to take the same value in both of those two. Um, in, in both of those two quadrants there, OK? But if I want to consider what's happening with sine, well, I know that sine is positive in the first quadrant, but sine is negative in quadrant four. OK, or I can think about the y value of these points. Well, the y value of this point is exactly opposite to the y value of this point. OK, and if I want to think about tangent, again, I know that tangent is positive in this quadrant. But in the fourth quadrant, I know the only trigonometric function which is positive is actually going to be cosine. So I know that tangent has to be negative in the fourth quadrant. So that's telling me that tangent should be odd, and so on and so forth. OK, we can use ASTC and the unit circle to give ourselves an understanding 
of uh, whether these functions are odd or even. OK. And, you know, we can sort of do the same logic that we originally started out with to find out that tangent and all those other trigonometric functions are going to be even or odd just by by their definition in terms of the points x comma y here and the point x comma negative y. Well, our definition for tangent was that tangent would of theta is equal to y over x. So we know that tangent of negative theta is going to be equal to negative y over x, which is equal to negative y over x, which is equal to negative tangent of theta. So these are like, you know, six different ways of thinking about whether these functions are even or odd. And the nice thing about trig, and I say nice, some of you might not think it's that nice. In my opinion, the nice thing about trig is there are, for most of these concepts, there are probably five or six or seven different ways of looking at the concept. And so for me, I feel like that's nice because it allows you to choose your favorite way and it gives you a lot of options so you know if you're more of like if you feel really motivated by like these geometric intuitions okay so like by drawing and just looking at the drawing and seeing with your own eyes what's happening with these points then you can take that method and that's perfectly fine and if you really like having a really hands-on definition of even and odd and then just going from there and using this sort of more mathematical approach, that's also perfectly fine. Um, so in my opinion, that's sort of a blessing. You get to have all these different uh, ways of thinking about it. Some students might feel like that's a curse because there's just like so much stuff to consider. But my point would be to you, just hone in on whatever you feel in your gut makes the most sense to you. And, and that method will probably, um, you know, be the kind of the best way of looking at things for you. So in this class, you know, I try to provide a few different perspectives each lecture so that you can see kind of all of the different ways of looking at it. Um, and from there, you can just kind of pick your favorite. All right. So this is about even and oddness of trigonometric functions. Um, and that is going to be sort of part and parcel of the next section, which we are now going to start on the graphs of trigonometric functions. And I'm really kind of pleased that I was able to find this GIF here or GIF, however you want to say it, um, because, and really, I would say don't pay much attention to these, the, the one on the top and bottom, but the one in the middle is doing, basically, this is sine theta. This is, this is sine theta, okay? And we'll see why in a second, okay? So what this is doing, okay, is that the height of this point, which is right here, okay, this point right here, we're saying that the height of that point is going to be equal to the height of this point right here, okay? So we see this relationship between these two points. It's the height of the point on the unit circle, okay? And then basically this direction is like the negative time direction. OK, so we just keep a record. Of how tall. Is the end point of the hand on our clock. OK, so this is the intuition for what it, what we're about to talk about.
okay, which is graphs of trigonometric functions. And before we talk about doing graphs of trigonometric functions, let's talk about what are the domain and range of these functions. Okay, so if we think about the domain, okay, the domain is going to be the set of all angles theta for which we can find a point on the unit circle. Okay, so if you think about it, we have our unit circle here. Theta can be zero or it can be up to 360 or we can go all the way to 720 or however many times around the circle we want. Okay, so there's not really an issue with the domain of sine and cosine, all right? All angles are permissible and all angles, no matter which angle I choose, be it a billion degrees or negative 10 degrees or whatever, okay, it's gonna somehow have to pass through the unit circle. Okay, it's gonna have to pass through the unit circle at some point. So sine and cosine are actually gonna have a domain of uh, all real numbers. Okay, and that works for whether we're using degrees or radians or whatever. Okay, it's just a matter of scaling. Okay, and then the range of sine, if we draw back our unit circle here, remember the range, mm, I like that, the range is going to tell us for all possible inputs of x, what are all of the possible in outputs of sine of theta? Well, I just consider if I take a look at all of these points x comma y, which could be produced by any given angle theta, I'm just considering every single point on the unit circle. And if I want to understand what the range of sine is, I just need to understand what values can the y coordinate of a point on the unit circle take? Okay, so let's think about this. What do we think is the maximal value that y can take if x squared plus y squared is equal to 1? What do we think? Does anybody have an opinion on what the maximal y value is going to be? Abdul Rahman says one. Does everyone agree or any other ideas? Savannah says one as well. Yeah, maybe it's maybe this is too obvious of a question, right? The maximal y value that could possibly happen is just, well, which point on the unit circle is the highest well it's this point right here and we know that this point the x value is zero so if we get zero squared plus y squared is equal to one then we know that y should be equal to one that's how we maximize y okay and likewise the smallest possible value that y could take would be if we get y equals negative one Okay, so the range then is going to be all of the possible y values that can be taken by points on the unit circle. And it looks like all the possible y values which can be taken by points on the unit circle is going to be all of the numbers such that our number should be larger than or equal to negative one and less than or equal to one. So our range is going to be negative one comma one. OK. Now, the domain of cosine is again going to be all real numbers because, I mean, any angle that we choose, it's going to go through a point on the unit circle. And that point will have an X value. OK, and then the range of cosine is a might be a little bit confusing, OK, for the following reason. 
the cosine function has an output. And the output of the cosine function is the X coordinate. OK, so we're used to thinking of range as being maybe all Y coordinates. But we got to remember that in this case, Y is equal to cosine of theta, which is going to be equal to the X coordinate in this point here. So in this case, when we want to think about the range of cosine, we want to look at the unit circle and we want to consider what is the maximal and minimal value of X? OK. What is the maximal value that X can take if X squared plus Y squared equals one? And really, we're asking the same exact question as before, right? We have the same question and X squared and Y squared kind of fulfill the same role in this equation. So it turns out that if we just take Y to be zero and then we have X squared equals one, then we get X should be equal to one. So in this case, our maximal point is happening right here and it's the point one comma zero. And the minimal point will be on the left side and it'll be negative one comma zero. Okay, so I think the reason that this is so confusing is when we think of range, we want to think of all the y coordinates of a function. But in our case, when we write cosine theta, what we're saying is that y is equal to cosine theta, and so y is equal to the x coordinate of those points. So when we think about the range, it might be better to think not about all y coordinates, but rather to think about all outputs of the function. And in this case, the function outputs the x coordinate. So we want to consider all the possible values of x coordinates on the unit circle, which x can take any value, which is again between negative one and one. So for this range, we get negative one comma one again. OK, so this is the domain and range of sine and cosine. Their domain is all real numbers and their range is the same. It's just from negative one to one. Any questions about the domain and range of sine and cosine? Seems like no questions, so we'll move on and get to the oh, almost to the meat. In fact, we might not even have quite have time to do this graphing business. But OK, let's consider one more thing. All oh, right, OK, this drawing here where I said theta can be anything. This was kind of my my way of showing that uh, the range or sorry, the domain of sine and cosine are going to be all real numbers because you can take any angle that you want and you can go around as many times as you want. You could do a billion degrees. You could do negative a billion degrees. You could do, I don't know, pi degrees or E degrees or something like that. Uh, and no matter which angle we choose, we're going to be able to find the sine and cosine of that angle because no matter which angle we choose, it's going to have to go through some point on the unit circle. OK, so that's why the domain and range are all real numbers. OK, so now let's consider the following question. Which is this. Maybe I should put it as what are. The zeros of sine and cosine. OK, so we want to know. So, you know, if we think about zeros, 
the, the main place that we see zeros is what is the zeros of a quadratic function like x squared plus 2x plus 1. And we want to know which values of x make this equation zero. OK, and when we find the values of x which make this equation zero, we call them the zeros. So we would factor this, we'd get x plus 1 times x plus 1. And then we would solve x plus 1 is equal to zero, and therefore x is equal to negative 1. So we get that x is equal to negative 1 is a zero of the equation uh, x squared plus 2x plus 1 is equal to 0, or of the function f of x, which is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1. Okay, so this is the nomenclature. This is how we say things about zeros. And sine is, again, just another function. So it's not a quadratic function, but it is a function, and it does have zeros. And again, this, the zeros in our case are going to be the values of theta which cause the function to be equal to zero when we plug them in. OK, so we want to solve for theta such that this is true. We want theta such that sine of theta is equal to zero. OK, and what this amounts to doing is if I just draw my unit circle. I know that sine of theta is equal to the y coordinate of any point which is on my unit circle. So I consider all of the points which are on the unit circle. And I just want to consider, well, which points on the unit circle have a y coordinate which is zero? Well, that's exactly two points. It's going to be not that one, and not that one, and not that one. It's going to be this point here on the right is the point one comma zero. So this is a place where this is our y coordinate, which is equal to sine of theta. sine of theta. And it's also going to occur at negative 1 comma 0, where, again, y, our sine of theta, is going to be equal to 0. So I just want to know, well, what are the angles uh, Man, what color should I use here? Maybe I want to contrast. Okay, maybe purple. What are the angles theta which produce a point on the unit circle which gives us a y value of zero? Okay, so it's going to be these angles here, which are pointing either directly in the positive x direction, i.e. 0, 0 degrees, or it's going to be the one which is pointing directly in the negative x direction, which would be uh, 180 degrees. or any multiple thereof, okay? So we know that sine of zero equals zero. We know sine of pi equals zero if we're using radians. And then what is sine of two pi? Well, sine of two pi is again equal to sine of zero since those have the same coterminal axis and that's equal to zero. And then we get sine of 3 pi. Well, 3 pi is coterminal to pi is equal to 0. And then sine of 4 pi is again coterminal to 0. So we get sine of 0 here is equal to 0, and so on and so forth. So we know that sine of 
n pi is equal to zero, where n is any integer. Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. Dot, dot, dot. Okay. So that's how we find the zeros of sine. And we'll do cosine next time. So class is over starting now. Um, office hours start now and they go until 1130. So please stick around if you have more questions about what we've been talking about. Um, otherwise, I'll see everybody tomorrow. All right, I'm going to stop this recording.